it goes through our session today as well, please feel free to let me know any time you'd like to ask a question. You can feel free to just raise your hand or you can give me an emoticon and just let me know how you're doing if you need a quick break or, again, if you agree with something that you hear or if you disagree, let me know that too because, again, the regulations are very open to interpretation and we're going to be looking at the findings looking at the trends that have been posted through the different agencies, the FDA, the EMA, the PMDA, MHRA, and looking at those trends and really they're very similar. So let's talk about what that means. So feel free to chat, feel free to raise your hand, feel free to speak up at any point. So our objective for today, to review recent FDA, European Medicines Agency, and Health Canada findings for clinical investigators, sponsors and IRBs, determine areas of compliance concentration for regulatory agencies, discuss what factors may be helping drive the present approach and what it may mean for future compliance considerations, and finally examine best practices for responding to regulatory communication. And as a reference, I've also provided a number of different handouts to you. They're just where the data is being pulled from, so you want to review them in more detail. They're all publicly available, and many of you have already, already probably reviewed these. But again, our job today, or our goal today, is to look at, with a global eye in terms of trends we're seeing and focus our systems and our thought processes on, for, on improvement and a change in maybe some of our quality assurance thinking and our day-to-day -day practices. So what's been provided to you is just the FDA guidances from this past year. And again, nothing in here is earth shattering. It's very similar to the trends we've seen for the past five, 10 years. So maybe that's good news that we're not getting any worse, but maybe it's not good news in that our systems also have not changed despite seeing these trends, despite the FDA being very transparent and providing a wealth of feedback in terms of their warning letters, in terms of their annual metrics. And then I've also provided for reference the EMA document. Again, it's just right here in case you're interested in looking at it in more detail. It explains some of the findings in a little bit more depth. And this is not new. But if you don't use this, or if you don't have this, or if you don't provide this as a regular reference for your team, for the CRAs, or even your investigators, or anybody who's even new to clinical research, I strongly recommend it. So this is the bioresearch monitoring document, essentially, for clinical investigators and sponsor investigators. And this is the document that is actually used by the FDA staff. And I've been very fortunate to have FDA inspectors in my audience on several occasions with Barnett workshops or in workshops that I've attended given by other individuals through ACRP or SOCRA or different forums online. And they have attested to the fact that, yes, they really do use this document. So when we have inspections at our site, the findings shouldn't be a surprise. It is very, very clear in this document exactly what they are looking for, exactly what they are looking at. And again, the citations are very clear. I'll just jump a little bit to the back of the document before we start to see some of the listings. Oops, went too far, but again, for what the citations actually are. So it is not a surprise. And very recently I've had a question come up from one of the sponsors that I've worked with and had run a training onboarding program for their CRAs, and they were having a very strong internal debate about whether something was a deviation or not. Essentially, a subject had signed on the wrong line on the informed consent, and the investigator had lined through, and the investigator had signed because it was the investigator line. The investigator signed and dated, and the subject signed and dated on another line, and they felt that it was a deviation that the investigator had made the change on the line. And again, I brought it back to here is what would actually be cited. The fact that the subject was consented was appropriate. In fact, they met the regulation in terms of the intent of consent, that it took place prior to any trial-related procedures is correct. This was a documentation error, and it should be addressed, but it's not a deviation. This is not something you would see cited 
in the event of an FDA inspection. So again, just provided to you as a reminder that we have all this information at our fingertips. Then I provided just to reference again the inspector report from Health Canada. And from MHRA, this is really a pharmacovigilance metrics report because they haven't provided anything very recent in terms of metrics on their clinical trials monitoring. But when we get to the end of today's presentation, there's a little bit of information about some of the joint inspections that they'll be doing. Why does the FDA inspect? Well, to ensure the integrity of the clinical research data generated through the conduct of the study and the protection of human research participants from whom that data is collected. It's a very generic statement with a lot of meaning behind it. 